Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, on behalf of the board of directors, all the staff and volunteers at Verse by Verse Ministry International, I want to welcome you to the 2014 Growing in Grace and Truth Bible Conference. And as you just heard, I'm Stephen Armstrong. I'm the director of Verse by Verse Ministry, and I'm very pleased that you're here to join us tonight. I know there's a lot of folks who won't be here until after tonight. We still have a good number of folks waiting to join us. And so we're only going to continue to grow as the weekend goes, and I'm really looking forward to that. I think you're going to have a fruitful and enjoyable three days of Bible teaching and discussion and fellowship and worship and prayer. And I want to extend my personal thanks first to my fellow speakers, to Dr. Thomas Ice and to Pastor Jim Bryant, who are joining me this year in speaking. You have the, the blessing of some very privileged and qualified and talented teachers here with us today and during this weekend. And I also want to recognize and thank the service of our worship team. You've had the, the blessing of hearing them so far, and you can see the talent that God has assembled for us there. Jose and Yvette Rosari are leading our worship team and doing a great job, and we have also the blessings of Pastor Jeffrey Dyke, who's come from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kentucky, and I'm thankful that he could come out and lead with us as well. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Steve Branson and all the staff and, and congregation here at Village Parkway Baptist Church. You guys have opened your doors to us, made this possible. We very much appreciate that. And then last but certainly not least, I want to thank all the volunteers, all those friendly people you see running around in those blue shirts. Uh, those are folks who are giving of their time to serve you and to make this conference possible. Let's tell them thanks when you see them, because I know they are working hard. This is the second year we've done this conference in San Antonio. Last year was our inaugural event. I think it was a great start, but we intend to build on that foundation this year. And I hope you've already begun to see that in the little bit of the conference that's already taken place. Tonight, I have the honor of kicking off the formal teaching sessions, or these main sessions, as we call them. Tomorrow evening, it'll be Dr. Thomas Ice as our keynote, and then on Saturday morning, Jim Bryant is going to conclude with the main session for the morning then. And as you know already, in addition to the main sessions, you've got all of the breakout sessions. There's a total of six different topics going on, and at the end of it all, we have the question and answer that I hope you'll be a part of as well. So I want to encourage you to take full advantage of what you have available to you here during this conference. Attend as many of these sessions as you can. Enjoy the awesome worship that you're going to hear. Take time uh, to meet and converse with the speakers and with each other, with the fellow attendees. Meet with our prayer team. Just let us bless you. That's what we're here to do. And the topic this year, as you know, is living in the last days. Now, anytime somebody starts to raise the topic of, let's just call it the end of the world, as some might think, we're talking anyway. Anytime you get into that topic, it'll raise a lot of interest for some, but it'll raise a lot of concern for others. Wouldn't you agree? Some of us get really excited, I think, at the prospect of learning more about what God's Word has to tell us about the future, and I have to assume that that's, for the most part, who I'm looking at right now, because otherwise you wandered into the wrong place. <laughs> and that's because we're comfortable, to some degree, with these discussions and with the idea of the age coming to an end. We're excited, I guess, to know that the Lord's coming back, and perhaps sooner than we thought, and we're ready for a life of glory when He comes. We're looking forward to the kingdom. We're all thinking about how to be ready. We're like one of those enterprising students in the small group Bible study that was sitting around discussing what would be the case if they had some unforeseen event in their life. Maybe they died sooner than they expected, or maybe Judgment Day came upon them. And the leader of the discussion turned to the group, and he said, um, friends, we're all going to die someday. None of us really knows when. But if we were to do a better job of preparing ourselves for that inevitable event, what would we do? For example, if you knew that the Lord was coming in the next month or in the next year, what would you do? Well, the first guy that spoke up said, well, I, I would go into my community and I would minister to the, go the gospel to those who had not yet accepted the Lord. And of course, that got a very strong response from the group, right? Everybody loved that answer. And then one lady spoke up and said, well, I dedicate all of my remaining time to serving God and my family and my church and my fellow man, and I do it with even greater conviction. And yet again, everyone said, that's, that's wonderful. Who wouldn't want to do that? But then there was a guy in the back. There's always this one guy. And he spoke up and he said, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd go to my mother-in-law's house for whatever time remained. Even if he was coming back in four weeks, I'd spend my last four weeks at my mother-in-law's house. Well, that got everyone confused. Why, why would you want to go to your mother-in-law's house for four weeks? And the guy said, well, because it would be the longest four weeks of my life. 
which is just proof <laughs> that there's always people who can make the best of any circumstance, even the end of the world. If that's you, well, then you've come to the right conference, right? Because we're all about helping you gain a better understanding of the last days so that you're better prepared for what they bring. But we also know those people, maybe family, maybe friends, who are, let's say they shy away from discussions of things like tribulation or the apocalypse or the rapture or anything that alludes to a coming end. And I think it's the concerns of that group that I want to address tonight, if not for you per, per se, perhaps that you can use what you learn for the sake of others you know. And I think if you take this general idea, this group of people who are not prone to interest in the last days, I think you can divide them into two halves. First, you've got the skeptics. You've got those out there who don't believe in an end, or they don't believe that it's coming anytime soon. They'll tell you that there's always been some crackpot that's come along and told us that the end is nigh, and those guys always turn out to be wrong, and they'll remind you of things like Y2K, whatever happened to that? Or the Mayan calendar of 2012, where did that go? Or that thing that Harold Camping did, remember this guy came along not long ago and started predicting the rapture, such an unfortunate and, and misguided thing that guy did, right? Henry Miller sums up this point really succinctly. He says, the world dies over and over, but the skeleton always gets up and walks. Because there are so many of these crackpots that have come and gone, this camp will conclude that you cannot know the future, so let's stop trying to figure it out. It's a waste of time. And friends, there are those among the Christian faith who have that same mindset, I've found who typically cite Jesus' statement in Matthew 24, in which he said that no one knows the day or the hour. They run to that, and they cite it as if to suggest Jesus discourages Christians from any curiosity or any interest whatsoever in what the Bible has given us concerning prophecy. There's a well-known megachurch pastor who will go unnamed for our sake tonight who, who has this quote in one of his best-selling books. It says, Today there's a growing interest in the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. When will it happen? Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples asked him the same question, and his answer was quite revealing. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The quote goes on, when the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I've given you. Focus on that. Speculating, and so then the writer goes on, speculating on the exact timing of Christ's return is futile because Jesus said, and here's the quote, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Since Jesus said he didn't know the day or the hour, why should you try to figure it out? What we do know for sure is this. Jesus will not return until everyone God wants to hear the good news has heard it. Jesus said the good news about God's kingdom will be preached in all the world to every nation. Then the end will come. So if you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. Now, time does not permit me to offer a point-by-point -point refutation of this nonsense. But I will make a couple of observations. First, the author repeatedly misuses and misinterprets Scripture on this issue. If someone isn't willing to handle the text of Scripture honestly, friends, then they're not going to understand much, and they're not going to be any of help to us, and that's unfortunately what we're looking at. But secondly, and more to the point, Jesus said we can't know the day or the hour of his appearing, but he didn't say we can't understand the prophecy given in the Bible. This author calls study of end time scripture speculating on the exact timing of Christ's return. Friends, just because someone takes a sincere and healthy interest in the Bible's teaching on end times doesn't mean they're attempting to arrive at the exact timing of Christ's return. I know a lot of people who spend a lot of time and work very hard and sincerely to understand end time scripture, and I have never heard any one of them ever attempt to predict the exact timing of Christ's return. And yet this author seems to equate the two. As I listen to his own words, I sense that maybe he's uncomfortable handling prophecy. And maybe that's the issue. And then lastly, this author never explains why, if we're not supposed to, to be interested in eschatology at all, why does the Bible provide us with so much of it? 
He never explains what we're to do with it all if we're not supposed to pay any attention to it. It's just bizarre. Now, that's one camp, right? That's the we can't tell, we shouldn't know camp. But then there's a second camp who I think avoid the study of prophecy because it's just too terrible to contemplate. I think these folks do believe the Bible reveals facts about what's coming. They just don't want to know what it says. It's scary. It's worrisome. And to some extent, they agree with the first camp. If you can't do anything about it, then we're just better not knowing anything about it. For this group, ignorance is bliss, or so they think. It's like trying to force them to watch a horror movie. They, they just run out of the theater with their eyes closed. They don't want to see what the Bible has to say. I think this group may share some of the same concerns with the first, right? They may not understand it, and the fear of it is from the lack of understanding of it, and perhaps also from a lack of confidence that the Lord is prepared to uh, preserve them, to spare them from the terrible things that are predicted. Well, as you might expect, I see things differently from either of these camps. I believe the Lord reveals many details in his plan for the end of the age, and he does so, friends, to encourage us. He does so to comfort the believer. The more you study, the more excited you're going to be for your Lord's return and the events that lead up to his return. And as your anticipation builds, then you're going to focus increasingly on serving him and preparing your hearts for that coming kingdom. Plus, I might add, you'll be in a better position to help others who don't understand these things and are perhaps unnecessarily concerned. But only if you understand it yourself. So let's spend this evening in a passage of Scripture that I think addresses the objections of both the cynic and the blissfully ignorant. We'll begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. And as you're turning to 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and I apologize, we will not have these uh, scriptures on the screen. I, I would actually prefer that you'd have them on your lap. As we're turning there, let me pray briefly over the text. Dear Heavenly Father, speak with your words, by your word, to our hearts, by your spirit. Let not the thoughts of a man, nor his weaknesses, nor his inability to appreciate these truths stand in the way of the spirit delivering them to the hearts who will hear tonight. And as we receive them, we know we receive them from you, and therefore, Father, we give all glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Beginning in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, Paul writes, Now as to the love of the brethren, well, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and to work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. I want to pause there. If you know anything about this section of 1 Thessalonians 4 and into chapter 5, then you already know this passage has the potential to draw me into an examination of some very intriguing end times events. And I'm certain that, that the events that are contained in these two chapters are in, uh, events we do want to study. They're very important. In fact, I'm sure you're going to get to them during the course of this conference. My esteemed colleagues and I are going to address them in detail in either other main sessions or in the breakouts. So don't worry. You're going to have a chance to get into what Paul's talking about here in the eschatology, but not tonight. Not entirely. I have a different purpose in this passage. First, let's get to the background of what Paul's writing about here. In Paul's case here, he's writing to a church in the city of Thessalonica to Christians. And this is a city located in the Roman province of Macedonia. That's present-day Greece. Paul founded this church in much the same way that he would found most of the churches he founded, his typical pattern. He'd enter the city. He'd make a beeline straight for the synagogue. And on the Sabbath, he would reason with Jews concerning Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And he made that case, arguing from the Old Testament, and in the case of Thessalonica, he made it on three successive Sabbaths, we're told, in the book of Acts. And many Jews in Thessalonica believed. And as often happens when you have new believers, there was persecution from the rest of the Jewish leaders in the city. And in this case, the persecution was quite intense. And along with that persecution, false teachers arrived in that city after Paul had departed, and they stirred up the church with some false teaching. And... 
In the case of these false teachers, they principally brought five concerns, or four concerns, sorry, into the church. First, they undermined the church's confidence and trust in Paul. So they said, don't believe Paul, don't trust what he says. They accused Paul of having abandoned the church in their time of need, of having left them behind to these miseries. Secondly, they distorted the gospel. Thirdly, they encouraged Christians to act in ways that were contrary to their witness, in particular with sexual immorality. Fourthly, they stirred up discontent within the church over social circumstances. And then fifthly, lastly, there was a fifth one. I knew there was. Lastly, and this is our purpose tonight in studying this passage, they told the church that the Lord's coming for the church had already happened and that these believers had been left behind. Now, as you expect, a teaching like that provoked a lot of anxiety in this church. Little of the New Testament canon had been written yet. The culture of the church was still fragile in forming. So the church had nothing to fall back on. They were desperately in need of apostolic direction and counsel. So Paul took up the pen and he wrote this letter and its companion in the New Testament in order to reassure the Thessalonians that they were under God's watchful eye and in his care, despite their difficult circumstances. And if you were to read through all of the letter we didn't cover, verses, chapter one rather, all the way into chapter four, if you were to read all of that, you'd find Paul going back over all of those points I just mentioned. He reinforces the truth of the gospel. He counters their false teaching on immorality. He encourages them to be content, to live a quiet life. Finally, he moves into addressing the importance of a proper understanding of end times. It's this final purpose that Paul had in writing that we need to consider this evening in addressing the cynic and in addressing the, quote, blissfully ignorant. Let's start with verses 9 through 12. Paul finishes addressing the concerns of the daily life I talked about. In verse 9, he begins with this introduction. Now, as to the love of the brethren, he's asking the central question of the Christian life, of our walk in Christ. How do I relate to my brothers and sisters and to the world at large. How do I live in this fallen world as a Christian? But curiously, Paul says, you know what? On that point, I really don't need to teach you very much because God is already at work within you teaching you to love one another. Friends, that's a powerful truth. It reminds us that the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us leads us to a loving attitude toward the brethren. By the Spirit, we are conformed to the likeness of Christ. And in that transformation, we get this supernatural ability to love one another, people who might otherwise be, well, let's be honest, unlovable. Furthermore, Paul says, their love is self-evident because they're already demonstrating it to one another. He's referring to the fact that this church was very generous. They would send money to other churches, particularly in Macedonia, who were poor and needed their assistance. In other words, they didn't just become hearers of the word. They were doers of the word. They didn't just say to their brothers, be warm, be filled, and go in peace. They said, here's some money so that you can do those things. They were showing their love through good deeds. So the church demonstrates Christ's love, Paul says. Now, that's a great testimony. Wouldn't you agree? If someone said that about you and about your church, your church that loves one another and shows that love and good deeds within the body of Christ, that would be a wonderful testimony, wouldn't it? I'm not sure a lot of churches can even reach that level of testimony today, can we? Not in all cases. But notice what Paul says. He says, you need to excel even more. You see, friends, that wasn't the end of the purpose of the church. That was barely the beginning. I find that statement so challenging for two reasons, most of all. First, He commands us to excel further, which suggests, friends, that loving one another inside the church is not enough. It's not enough. The church is called to possess and exhibit a proper witness, both inside the walls of the church and to the world. And perhaps it's in the reverse order. Loving one another is certainly a prerequisite for an effective witness, friends, but it's not a substitute for an effective witness. The church has to be purposeful about taking our light outside the walls of this building to a world that desperately needs it. So Paul says, look, you did great. You love one another. You're showing with deeds, but now here's the way you excel. And he says, you need to excel by living a certain kind of life, peaceful, contented, quiet, and doing it publicly in the community. If you want to stir unbelievers into seeking a relationship with Christ, then you need to show them what it looks like to live in the love of Christ. That's the first thing that I find challenging. Here's the second thing. Consider the circumstances of this church. We already covered a little of that. They're being attacked. They're being slandered. They're being persecuted. 
They're being ostracized. They're even being martyred in some cases by the world that they're supposed to go live in contentment before, in peace before them. And yet Paul says, that's your goal. Be calm, peaceful, tranquil in spite of this turmoil. Now, friends, he's not saying put on some Pollyannish, stiff upper lip and walk around like Vincent Peale, positive thinking pep talk has turned you into some crazy person. Paul's not unrealistic. He doesn't have these unrealistic expectations. He is appealing to the very source of Christian hope. What is it, friends, that lets you live that way in the face of persecution? The Christian hope is knowing that we have been saved from the penalty of death. We have nothing to fear from the end of our lives or from any earthly calamity that might lead to the end of our lives. For we all know that this body we have is going to dust one day, one way or another, and friends, so what? Let it go for crying out loud. The faster, the better for most of us. I won't hold, pick anybody out when I say that, but... Why can we say that? Because we have a confidence that there is something better awaiting us in eternity. We have nothing to fear from death because the Lord has saved us from the sting of death. Therefore, we don't need to fight back against those who seek to take our lives, do we? How ironic that Jerry introduced me as the guy with all the guns. We don't fight back against those who want to take our lives. We don't give heed to false teachers who would try to scare us into thinking that we have to turn back from Christ because woe is us, look at our circumstances. Who cares? They have nothing to offer us in return for the glory that awaits us in the kingdom. Therefore, friends, we can live in confidence to face trials that the enemy may bring, knowing that those things are temporary, and they are powerless. So friends, when the world's in a panic about economic calamity or wars or civil unrest or Ebola or whatever temporary thing might wave its way into town and pass on the next day, we don't care. Or we shouldn't. Not in the way the world does. We have love. One for another and then to the world. We have peace. We have confidence. Because who cares how you die? Who cares when you die? You're going to die. Or one way or the other, leave this body behind. Who cares how it happens? Just knowing that we're going to the next body after that moment means it doesn't matter. That's the basis of Paul's instructions here. When the world is teetering on the verge of chaos, we are praising the Lord all the more, knowing that that chaos that we're watching is proof of the approaching end of the age, and it signals the arrival of a new and better age for us, an age of glory. That's the basis. Now, Peter says something very similar that you probably already know in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with quietness and reverence. Friend, if you're saying to yourself, yeah, I'm supposed to be ready at any moment to give my testimony, that's not what Peter's saying. Peter's saying when the rest of the world is falling apart in front of everyone and you have this peace and hope that they don't understand, they're going to ask you, how can you be hopeful in the face of an Ebola epidemic? And you can say, well, because this body is temporary. I, I really don't care when it dies. I'm more interested in what's coming next. And you know what might follow from that, of course, is a conversation about how do I get that new body? How can you have this hope? The key to our unique perspective, or the key to our ambassadorship, is our unique perspective on death. So whether it's world disasters or collapses of one kind or another, or epidemics, or just the latest Kardashian reality show, no matter what comes down the road, we can be hopeful because we know where we're going. I want to borrow from Rudyard Kipling's famous poem if. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, I'm going to finish it differently. If you can do that, unbelievers will take note and ask why, and your witness will excel. All right, so what's the secret to doing that? I mean, we can describe it, we can say we should do it, but what's the secret to actually feeling like that in the moment? Come on, we've all been scared about something, right? We've all had that moment of concern about some situation, some health scare, some economic worry, some world disaster. We know the feeling, right, down in here. 
And up here it's telling us, mm, we shouldn't feel that way. But down here it's saying, I don't care, I do feel that way. When you feel that way, your witness changes. When your witness changes, you're not excelling. You're not doing what call, you've been called to do. So how do you do that? Paul answers that in the next section, verses 13 through 18. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, well, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend with a, uh, from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of, the, of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as I warned in the opening of my presentation tonight, this section of Paul's letter just grabs your attention so much. You want to dive into all this eschatology, don't you? I get that. But for tonight, just look at the first and the last verse of this passage, for you will get into the details of this elsewhere in the course of our conference. First, verse 13, Paul says, he doesn't want the church to be uninformed. And the Greek word for uninformed there, I think it'd be better translated ignorant. He doesn't want you to be ignorant. Don't remain ignorant. Ignorant of what? Well, based on what follows, it's clear that he doesn't want the church to be ignorant about the details of the Lord's appearing and our resurrection. And specifically, the appearing is a reference in Scripture to that eagerly awaited moment in which the Lord comes to claim his bride, the church. And you're going to learn more about that moment in some of the breakout sessions. I know Tommy is going to present one on the difference between this moment and the second coming, and that would be a good place to learn more. But back to verse 13. When you look at verse 13, it contradicts those who say to you or I that pursuing an understanding of end times is a folly that it's a waste of time. Paul says exactly the opposite of what that guy I read earlier said. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this stuff. You're not to remain ignorant of these details. And according to Paul, it's not only possible for you to understand these things, it's essential. A knowledge of how the Lord returns is essential learning for the Christian. A knowledge of how we receive our new bodies, how we are resurrected, is essential. It's not optional. Why? Because Paul says it's an antidote against hopelessness. Do you notice that? At the end of verse 13, he says, I don't want you to grieve when a brother or a sister in the Lord dies. Don't grieve over their death the way the world typically grieves over their dead, as with no hope. In Paul's day, the church had been disturbed by these false teachers. They had come into Thessalonica, and they had said that anyone who died prior to the Lord's coming to retrieve the church would miss the opportunity to go back with him. In other words, you would not get resurrected unless you were alive when it happened. And that, of course, left the church just terribly grieving over any time a believer died. They'd missed the opportunity to be taken back with Christ. It robbed them of their hope because it suggested that Christ's victory over death was hollow. If death of our physical body can separate us from the love of Christ, then death still holds some power over us, doesn't it? It would suggest we have little reason to hope any more than the rest of the world does for that regard. I mean, if your faith in Christ, friends, is only effective at saving you for as long as you remain physically alive, friends, that's no salvation at all. That's what they were being taught. It's false teaching. But friends, it wasn't the false teaching by itself that put this church in a period of hopelessness. It was the false teaching combined with their ignorance of the truth, such that they could fall prey to it, that they would believe it. And so what Paul does is he rescues them from this deception by bringing them into the knowledge of what is true. He says, I don't want you to remain ignorant. This is the problem with you as a church. Don't live like an unbeliever. Unbelievers grieve mightily in the face of death. If someone doesn't know Christ, if they haven't placed their trust in victory over death through faith in Christ, then they have no source of hope in the face of death. Death is literally an end for them. Now, they, they often carry these wishful thoughts of what death means, of thoughts of heaven. You know, everyone ends up there anyway. 
or of reincarnation, we're all coming back again, or some other fantasy. But friends, their fantasies are not grounded in anything. And that's why I think at the core of their being, in their consciousness, in their spirit, they're not taking any comfort from those thoughts. They espouse them, they cling on to them, but at the end of the day, they look at the dead body in the, in the coffin and they feel that same sense of loss that they can't get over. They grieve for what death means. Some have tried to salve that wound by just saying, well, death is the end of all things. It's nothingness after that. But even that's hard because I think the uncertainty of it is just eating them up. Friends, it all adds up to the same thing. No confidence and no hope in the face of death, a death they can't escape. But that's not us, right? We have a hope founded on a sure and trustworthy word from our Lord. The word that says that if he left, he's going to return. We know his promises are sure because we know his word is sure. We know our body will be replaced. We know the grave cannot hold us. We know if he was resurrected, we will be resurrected. We will be like him. That's the thing we know. That's the source of our hope. And friends, if you study your Bibles, then you'll have the position or the opportunity to look at current events knowing that the Bible says things get worse toward the end, not better. That turmoil precedes the Lord's appearing for the church. That governments become more corrupt. That men become more ungodly. That society becomes more ungodly. And that turmoil that will ensue is a sign that the Lord's return is near. Do you see how fundamentally different your perspective is when you have a knowledge of what to expect? While the world is concerned about the destruction of the atmosphere or the economic collapse of our country or whatever else comes down the road, we're not unconcerned for those things, but, but our hope isn't shaken by them. If you remain ignorant of what's coming, friends, you forfeit one of the greatest blessings available to the child of God, the peace that comes from that understanding. So I think you can understand, even in just this point, why we study the end times, why it's essential for maintaining an effective witness. Try witnessing to the world when you look just like them. If we call people to place trust in Christ, and then we go outward and we demonstrate no fruit from that relationship, who's going to take that testimony seriously? If you say you have good reason to look forward to the return of Christ, but then you are ignorant and frightened by the very events that tell you his coming is near, what kind of impression are you leaving on people concerning the return of Christ? You look like it's the worst thing in the world. You're dreading the possibility of it because you're too worried by things you don't understand. On the other hand, if you expect the world to fall apart because God intends to replace it, if you understand things get worse in anticipation of an antichrist, if you realize the apostasy of the church is the last step before the removal of the church, if you understand these things because God told you to look for them and to understand them as a sign of the times, then your hope increases in the face of what the world sees as greater reason to lack hope. And then what Peter said becomes all the more valuable because when they look at you and they say, are you crazy? You're not worried about these things? And you say, absolutely not. And then a good conversation can begin. A hope that's rooted in the truth of the word of God is a powerful tool when it is wielded publicly. That leads us to the last verse in the passage, verse 18. Paul says, comfort one another with these words. Paul had just finished explaining the circumstances that surround the Lord's appearing and the resurrection of the church. And then he says to the church, now, with what I just taught you, take all of that learning and I want you to go out and pass it around within the church, share it among one another, and I want you to do this so that you can comfort one another. Isn't it ironic that today there are Christians in certain circles who would prevent the sharing of teachings on the rapture or the resurrection? There are churches who will invite me in to speak so long as I don't speak on that topic. Why? Because it's controversial, because it causes discord, or so they think, because it's unnerving, because it makes people feel uncomfortable. The Bible says it's supposed to comfort you. Isn't that a shame? Paul says we're supposed to take the teaching that he delivered here and use it to decrease the concerns in the church because it has that effect naturally. It's clear that as you understand, the Lord's concern for his church trumps 
his activity in the world. In other words, he will not allow the turmoil of what's coming to injure the church that he loves and cares for. When you see that relationship in Scripture and you understand that God has a plan for the church, he's not going to forget us, he's not going to leave us behind, then there's every reason to be comforted by that fact, by that knowledge. Paul obviously expected the news of a resurrection of the church and the promised appearing of Christ to be of great comfort to this church. Why would it be any less so for us today? By the way, you find Jesus giving that promise in John 14, as I mentioned earlier. Let me read it to you. John 14, 1, Jesus said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings, dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Do you notice how he began that promise? He says, do not let your heart be troubled. The promise of Christ's appearing and return to claim his church, he says is a promise that does away with a troubled heart. I can say with confidence, friends, that if your studies of the end times has left you with apprehension rather than with comfort, then you're not doing it right. Whatever you've arrived at in your thinking, whatever theologies you've approached it with, wherever you've landed, if you're not comforted by the knowledge of what God has prepared in the Bible concerning the end, you miss something. Consider the last section for the night. Paul records from chapter 5, 1 down through 5.11. And again, we're not going to go through the passage entirely. There's only a couple of points in here that you need to see. I want you to see, though, as Paul develops his thought and reinforces it. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety. Then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you like a thief? For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for attaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him and therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Here again, it's so tempting to get in and unpack all of this stuff, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Paul is speaking about the arrival of the, the promised 70th week of Daniel. This is another topic to be addressed later. But to put a fine word to it, it's just tribulation he's talking about. He's talking about this coming period of destruction upon the world. Notice he says, this is a time in which the world will be telling itself, everything's great. We finally arrived at where we want to be, and then wham. They will not escape, Paul says, this coming wrath of God. But then you look at what Paul says toward the second half where I was sort of going through it there. Paul says, the coming destruction is not for us. It does not come upon believers. It's intended only for those who are in darkness. And that's not us. And then he concludes in verse 9 that we have not been destined or you could say appointed by the Lord to receive this wrath. Now as with the earlier passage I read in chapter 4, just focus on the first verse and the last. Paul's taking exactly the same approach here. In the first verse, he says, look, these are things you already know. Now, in chapter 4, he had started by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. Here now, he says, you should already know this. You've already been taught this stuff. In both cases, his point is the same. These are events you should know about. Remaining blissfully ignorant, friends, is a sign of spiritual immaturity, not a wise choice on your part. Or thinking that the Bible isn't meant to be understood is itself an indication you don't understand the Bible, not an indication of sophistication. Now consider this. The people who received this letter from Paul, every single one of the people who received this letter in Thessalonica, they all died without seeing any of the events that Paul described here. In fact, they haven't even happened yet. The appearing of the Lord hasn't come. 
The tribulation has not arrived? So that begs a big question. Why did Paul feel it was so important for the church to understand these things if they weren't going to experience them personally in their own day? Isn't that the favorite argument of so many in the church who would suggest, don't spend time investigating all these matters? They tell us, you know, if, it, if it's the case that we're not appointed to wrath, then, then why even worry about it? Why, why waste any time on this stuff then? If it's not for us, let's not study it. All right, by that same token, I could ask, why did Paul go to so much effort to teach it to them then? Why did Paul even write it down? If they're not necessary for them, they weren't necessary for us, why did he even mention it? Look what he said, though. He said, you've heard all this before. This isn't the first time he's mentioned it to them. Clearly, he thought it was important, so important that he not only told them once, he came back around and said, you know, let's make sure you got this the first time. Here's a second try at it. Moving a little further, you understand why he felt it was so important. Look at the last verse in 511. Paul says, once again, we are to encourage one another with these words. What's encouraging about the tribulation? It was much easier in chapter 4 when he ended with those words and you could get it right away, right? Be encouraged to know the Lord's coming back for you. Oh yes, Paul, that sounds very encouraging. <laughs> now he says, I want you to be encouraged to know about the tribulation. Oh, I'm not sure I am as encouraged by that, Paul. How are we comforted knowing that, for example, in verse 3, there's a great destruction poured out on the world in a future day and no one will escape? Well, if that's all Paul had told them, obviously that wouldn't have been very encouraging news whatsoever. But you have verses 4 through 11. It's the contrast that's encouraging. Paul told the church, you are not subject to those things. The wrath of God is reserved for those who live in darkness, that is unbelief. But those who've come into the light of the knowledge of Christ are not under that condemnation. And Paul adds that whether they have died already or whether they're still alive at the point that these events begin to kick off, either way, you're escaping it and you're going to live forever in Christ. Friends, you understand learning about the end of the age, coming to a conference like this, participating in these kinds of things involves learning two sides of a common story. First, you do learn about God's judgment against sin and his wrath against unrighteousness. There's no two ways about it. You have to understand God fully, and to do that, you need to understand that's a part of his story. Through that, you're going to learn God is just, that no one escapes the penalty of sin, not without a payment made in your behalf. You learn things like the general timeline. You learn the sequence in some, to some degree of what he has planned. You learn some of the signs that will tell us that we're near that outpouring of God's judgment. But by all of that knowledge, what you come away with is you are armed to explain to the world about a certain jeopardy that they face and you have a sense of urgency about it because you can see it coming for yourself. You'll be a far more effective advocate for the gospel when you understand what not having the gospel looks like and how close it is to their life. That's one half of it. But then there's the other half. And that other half, of course, is that you learn that by faith Christ has saved us from the wrath of God. Not just eternally, but even temporally. Even as he brings it out on the earth itself, you're saved from the wrath that he pours out on earth. The Bible says that Christ's death on the cross reconciled us to God and put us at peace with God. And when you are at peace with God, there is no place in that relationship for wrath. Thank the Lord. Friends, if, if that's not a source of joy and hope and confidence for you, not just in good days, but in the times of trial, I don't have a better one for you. There isn't a better one. Lastly, you come to a conference like this because the more you know about the end, the better you are at steering clear of the kind of false teaching and disturbances that this church encountered, which will lead you away from your hope and into concerns that you don't need to have. Paul's second letter, you may know, addresses this very thing. Talking to the church and saying, don't be disturbed as if from a letter from us. Don't be thinking that you've missed the rapture, you've missed the resurrection, you're now going through the tribulation. Don't let that nonsense take away your hope. I want to end tonight with something out of the letter of Hebrews. In chapter 6, just two verses, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, the, the, the writer of Hebrews talks to a church about where they should be in their spiritual maturity. What defines spiritual maturity? And he lists six things six topics in the church, six areas of biblical knowledge that he says every Christian should have as a beginning point 
Listen to this, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works or of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Did you get that? This writer listed six things that he said are the elementary teachings about the Christ. In other words, these are the ABCs. These are the Christianity 101 things that everybody should learn early and move on from, mature from. And did you notice the last two items in that list? Things he said every Christian should understand? The resurrection and eternal judgment. One is what Paul discusses in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and the other is what he discusses in chapter 5. You see the point? They're the beginning things. That's what you move on from. Those are the elementary things. Friends, how many in the church that you know couldn't effectively explain the biblical view of either of those two concepts if they were asked to do it? And I won't ask how many of us might be in that boat. Probably not many if you come to a conference like this, but there are certainly people in the church who have that problem. And the point is this writer says that's basic, that's foundational. And we've lost that. Is there any wonder that so many in the church have lost their confidence in the face of trials and in the face of calamity? I'll end with a quote. Elizabeth Prada tells a story of the power of studying God's word to bring us comfort. And not just in the knowledge of what we gain, but the supernatural power of God to change our hearts. This is the story she tells. She says, I was teaching the first and second grades on Wednesday night, and I had a good-sized group of six- and seven-year-olds mostly boys, active boys. It never failed to impress me and the other ladies in the room how the children stirred, I'm sorry, how they stilled from their activity to hear a Bible lesson. And as we got ready this particular night to start the lesson, one thing the kids had to do was to open their Bibles and turn to a page of text from which the curriculum was going to be taught. And these kids, their fine motor skills were not quite mature enough yet, so it would be hard for them to sort of page open the Bible and get to the right point. It took a few minutes for all the kids in the room to finally get there, and some kids got there faster than others. And on this one night, a second grade boy had got to the verse very quickly, and while he was waiting for everyone else to catch up, he started to read it to himself, but out loud. And it was Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5, and this is what he read. He says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, and that he hath made us, and not we ourselves. For we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. She goes on, the boy reread the first line again in a quiet voice. And I was watching and I was listening. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And then he stopped and he played with his shoelace for a second and he was quiet for a minute. And then he whispered aloud to no one in particular, I like that. I don't know why I like that, but I like that. And the lady concludes, This is why knowing the Bible in the midst of tragedy or personal stress can be helpful. This boy allowed the Spirit to apply truth and beauty to his heart. He let the Holy Spirit inspire, or the Holy inspired words, wash over him and rest in him. And though he had no ability to articulate why it blessed him, he yet understood it was a blessing and he acknowledged it. Friends, I can't put it any better. Trust me, or trust the Lord, better put, when he tells you that if you study the end times, it's a comfort. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, comfort us. Take your word, Father, as we study it. Even with our inability to grasp it all at some days and with the gaps of our understanding that still persist, Father, despite all of that, Bless us, Father, with the comfort that you promise. Bless us, Father, with an understanding of our times. And do these things, Father, not for selfish purposes, but so that we may excel all the more in taking the love of the brethren outside the building that we occupy on Sunday and showing the world a hope that they do not know. 
Give us eyes for eternity, the wisdom to see these things so that when we react, we don't react from a, a gut that is scared and worried, but we react from a heart that's been enlightened by the truth of Scripture. And then, Father, as we live out that witness, as we do as you've called us to do, as we spend our days on this earth as ambassadors, I pray, Father, that you'd encourage us by showing us how we influence others and you use that to call them into faith. Let us be encouraged to see brothers and sisters of the Lord made in front of our very eyes through a witness that you created in our hearts. That's the privilege we have of serving you in these last days, in what days remain. And then finally, I pray for all who've assembled here and will over the next three days that you take all that we learn and give us an urgency, Father, to share it, to be those who would take what we learn and put it to work in these last days. For that's our purpose, Father. We know that. Thank you for this conference and for the first night and all that you brought to, to bring it about. And I ask, Father, the next two days would be equally enriching by your Spirit. Send us away safely. Bring us back tomorrow in your will. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.